Welcome, everyone. This is a, a, a career fair for state and federal agencies. I'm Ramzi Mahmoud, uh, Director of Office of Water Programs. We call it OWP at Sac State. We are actually celebrating our 50th anniversary uh, this year. I've been a director for 25 years. We are a self-supported center, and we are the largest uh, training provider in the nation for um, operators and managers of uh, water, wastewater distribution systems, and collection systems. We have 19 books that we publish, and all states and provinces of Canada use our manuals. So first, I want to thank uh, CWA for asking me to be the host and also organizing this webinar, which comes at a perfect time. Um, <clears throat> so, and the reason is I'm saying this because we are really at a historic tight labor market. At least in my career, I haven't seen something like this, where we have a lot more jobs available than candidates. That's one. And the other one is we hear about this silver tsunami. Uh, basically, in the next five years to 10, maybe, we will have a bunch of retirements. And it started already. I'm part of that tsunami, by the way. So within five years, that's what it says. So, and you, as as an invitee here and participant, you come at the right time because as employers, we are scrambling around looking for ways to change our systems based on the new conditions. So you have it. Now it's perfect time for you also to learn about the new conditions so that you pursue a, a job that you're passionate about. So speaking of passion, we're in an industry, basically all of us, most of us are passionate about what we do. We are protectors of public health and the environment. So with that, I want to thank both the US EPA and DWR for having two panels. And we will start with uh, EPA. And I'm honored to introduce uh, Camille Weber. Camille is the Recruitment and Outreach Coordinator in the EPA Pacific Southwest Mission Support Division. She helps uh, lead the region's recruitment effort by establishing relationship with nationally identified minority serving institutions and providing workshops on federal hiring process to colleges, universities, and community partners. Camille, it's yours. Thank you so much, Ramsey, for the introduction. So as Ramsey mentioned, my name is Camille Weber, and I'm from the Environmental Protection Agency Pacific Southwest, and I'm here with my two colleagues, Loretta Venegas and Jason Brush, who joined me from the Pacific Southwest Water Division, specifically the Tribal Clean Water Section. So Loretta is an environmental protection specialist in that section, and Jason Rush is a hiring manager in this section. So we're going to start off our 30 minutes uh, with first kind of a 15 minute panel so that you folks can kind of get a sense from Loretta and Jason what it's like to work at the EPA, why they decided to stay for so many years. Um, and some of the things that we generally look for when we're hiring for candidates. Um, and then I'll go ahead and take over the last 15 minutes and I'll share with you folks um, some open vacancies that we have. And you're really joining in at a great time because we have not only recent graduate positions that are open throughout our region, but we also have internship positions that have opened up throughout our region as well. So if you're not familiar with the Environmental Protection Agency, our agency's mission is to protect human health and the environment. And the Pacific Southwest office, which is where all three of us are currently working in, um, is headquartered in San Francisco, and we service, um, you know, California, Nevada, Arizona, 
Hawaii, um, the Pacific Islands, and 148 federally recognized tribes. Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and kick off our panel discussion. So Jason and Loretta, our first question to you is, can you please introduce yourselves and let us know what your current position is in EPA Region 9, what you studied in college, and how did you make your way to the EPA? And Jason, I'll go ahead and start with you first. Oh, you're on mute. Every time. Thanks so much, Camille, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us at this event with our California partners. Um, my name is Jason Brush again. I have been at the US Environmental Protection Agency for 21 years. And um, it is such a great place to work. I, uh, like I think you'll hear as a theme throughout what we're talking about today, and you heard Ramsey al already say, um, we're mission-driven folks. And we, we are connected to the mission of protecting human health and the environment, and specifically through um, the water programs that Congress has passed over the years. Um, this is a, a momentous year with where the Clean Water Act is turning 50 years old. Um, so we are celebrating this year all the accomplishments of, under the Clean Water Act. And um, we have a, a real partnership uh, in implementing those programs with our states and with our tribes. So I'm really pleased to be here um, as the federal side of that uh, equation but also to talk about um, our relationship with tribal governments. And in my region here uh, in, in EPA, which again, as Camille said, is four Western states, we have almost 150 tribes. So it's, it's quite a lot of relationships and diversity uh, among not only the geography and waterways of our states, uh, but also the, the cultural histories and um, practices of, of 148 cultures around our region. Um, as for me personally, the question was kind of like, how'd I get here? And, and uh, I, I was talking about this with Camille beforehand a little um, about maybe framing this up in terms of there's no one way to do this. Um, there are so many different paths. And I think often folks will think, um, well, I need to go to school for a STEM degree, right? And I need to, to go uh, uh, for, if I'm gonna work at an EPA, I need to be a scientist. And we have lots of science jobs. And that is certainly the case for some jobs, um, including some water engineer folks uh, with working directly with infrastructure. Um, but it's not the case for everybody. And my team um, are, um, you know, also a diverse team, but not uh, a, a group of scientists. And we work with our tribes through grants programs. Um, so the skill sets we're looking for at EPA can be scientific and technical, but um, the other legs of the stool that EPA has in our mission, um, three quarters of our budget goes right back out the door in grants. And so we are a huge grant making organization and there is a lot of um, need uh, there always has been a lot of need to manage a tremendous amount of grants um, going to our states, our tribes, our territories. Um, but right now is a particularly um, a particularly big moment for grants because, as many of you will know from from the news, uh, the bipartisan infra infrastructure law or bill is providing huge amounts of money to various federal agencies, governments, and. and federal agencies' budgets, uh, including EPAs, um, to implement uh, a lot of our existing programs with a huge plus up, right? So we are hiring like crazy for bill roles, uh, as well as our traditional roles at the agency. And a lot of those are not necessarily uh, required to be scientists. So I am a case in point. I went to school at the University of uh, California at Santa Cruz as a major in anthropology. So I was a social scientist degree, um, became interested in ecology and um, evolution late in that degree, and eventually decided to go to grad school for the same program. I focused on primate evolution and behavior, 
and did field work in, in South America for my master's program uh, on South American monkeys. But I was still interested in general principles of ecology and how the US government applies those principles in implementing our laws. So I thought, why don't I knock on the door at the EPA? Um, so I did that and um, was hired in 2001 into uh, the water division where I've been my whole career. Uh, I was hired into the wetlands program, which is a corner of the Clean Water Act that deals with um, discharges of fill material into wetlands. So uh, you need a permit if you're gonna fill in a wetland. And the way we evaluate those permits uh, draws on that scientific knowledge from my background in ecology about minimizing impacts to the aquatic ecosystem. Um, and that's where I started out. I worked there as a staff person in that program for eight years. And then I was promoted to manage that program for another eight. And uh, only in the last five years have I moved over to the tribal program. Um, and uh, I can talk a, a lot more about that, um, but that's a little bit of my history and what has kept, drew me to the agency and what has kept me here all this time. Thanks so much, Jason. And I know, Loretta, you have slightly a different story in coming to the agency. So how about you? How did you find yourself at the EPA? Now, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Loretta Venegas, and um, I also work at EPA Region 9 in San Francisco in the same section um, with Jason, and I am an environmental protection specialist. Majority of my role is a grants, a Clean Water Act Tribal Grants Project Officer. Um, I have been with the agency for 31 years, which seems a lot, but looking back, it's really been very exciting and challenging, and time has just kind of gone by pretty quickly. Um, I came to the EPA, oh, let me just say, I did study at San Francisco State University, um, studied biology. My goal was to become a nurse. I wanted to help people with the health. And um, as I was studying that, I also um, majored in ethnic studies, basically La Raza studies, history, working with um, communities, organizing communities. So those were both my interests. Um, I came to EPA, I had a classmate in our biology class, and I still remember where, and this is where the outreach occurs, right, word of mouth, word of mouth, um, EPA had a stay in school program, um, so for the students, this is how, um, which is sort of like pathways now, but this is, uh, you can continue to work uh, part time and also go to school. Um, there was a summer program, so my goal was to, you know, it sounded like a really interesting position, job, EPA. I, I had heard about EPA, but wasn't sure about the mission, so I applied and um, I was able to work and also convert to permanent part-time after that in the stay-in-school program. So overall, um, as I learned more about EPA and working with the tribal governments, that's where my passion is. Um, it was, you know, the science uh, background to help understand the technology working under the Clean Water Act and also managing grants, working with the tribal governments as um, was stated, we work with 148. And I can say that I have worked with all of them in different programs, either if it's the infrastructure, working with their drinking water and wastewater systems, or under the Clean Water Act, the wetlands, water quality, non-point source. So it's been a diverse, and that's why I say it's been very um, exciting to learn about all the different programs um, that we offer tribal governments. And um, that's what has kept me on for 30, 31 years, and I continue to learn each day. You always learn something new. It's always exciting. Different administrations have different uh, challenges with rules. Um, and so, yeah, so that that's what I would say. Awesome. Thanks so much. And you both are life for EPA folks, um, which for, you know, this generation of folks, you know, entering the workforce, that's not really something um, that's, you know, occurs very often. So I'm glad to hear that your passions have both can kept you here. Um, and I do want to put a plug uh, for additional things that help keep, you know, folks happy within the agency. Uh, we really do put in, you know, an emphasis on work life balance. A lot of us mm -hmm. um, who work at the EPA are in different types of schedules that 
you know, allow for a lot of flexibility, which is great, you know, down the line when you have kiddos and families and dependents that you have to work on, or if you just want to take a mental health day, you have those type of options to do so in that flexible scheduling, as well as other kind of benefits like TSP, which is like 401k, um, and lots of accrued leave as you uh, go up in the ranks. But I want to end our conversation today by asking you both, you know, for folks who are interested in working at the EPA, what are some things that could make our audience members competitive um, in, you know, our industry? What are some things, maybe one or two pieces of advice that you can give um, to make someone, you know, just stand out a little bit more on their application? So I'm going to start with Loretta this time, and Loretta, maybe you can give feedback as a staff member, and then Jason, from your perspective as a supervisor and hiring manager. Loretta? Um, so I would say definitely in investing in yourself, right? Um, keep maintaining your skills. Um, I know when you're in school, it's easier, but when you're out of school, you kind of have to do that and, you know, find the time to do that on, in your own personal life. So I would definitely encourage um, to do that, develop uh, and strengthen as any skills, interpersonal skills as well. Um, within the agency, we work a lot in teams, working with different people. So I would definitely encourage you to um, strengthen those areas as well. So those were the two that I was able to think of. Yeah, I think that's really, really important. Lifelong learning, um, looking at for people who are curious uh, and, and continue to want to learn. Like Loretta said earlier, part of why we've been here so long is that it's never gotten boring. It's never gotten old. There's so much to learn every day. So we look for that quality when people come to sit down for an interview. Um, maybe echoing a little bit of what I said earlier about not being so laser focused on the STEM skills uh, necessarily. Um, you know, those things get you in the door, but um, the the technical skills can also be taught. And so what I look for in an interview is a lot more of the soft skills, people who are mission driven, of a public service orientation. They recognize working for the government means we're serving the public. Um, people who value the, you know, not just that public service ethic, but also attending to those who have not uh, necessarily gotten as much attention in the past, the, the people who are most vulnerable. Um, so it the, the skills get you in the door and then the, the soft skills and the values are really what catch my attention. Um, for being a good fit at EPA, for working well with this in this culture. Um, and um, as Loretta said, the, the interpersonal part of it too. Um, we, we are um, an information and convening agency. Um, so bringing people together and helping people solve problems is uh, a really critical aptitude that really sets you apart. Um, I'll also just comment on, you know, what um, Camille said about it's less common these days, maybe for, for people to stay in careers for uh, long periods of time, but our agency kind of lends itself to that. Um, and even the younger people that I've seen hired in the last five to 10 years, um, that's another thing that we, uh, I don't want to say look for, but value is, is um, tenacity. A resilience and a willingness to stick it out and learn, um, even as Supreme Courts give you bad rulings, even as administrations change, even as um, you know all of these things happen, there's still plenty to learn and lots of service to provide. So with, with those core values, I find that people tend to stick around at EPA a good long time. And I just wanted to add just one more thing, Camille, I was thinking as Jason was speaking, um, you know, as we're here presenting at this water career fair, it's also good to just keep an open mind, because I know when we're inter interviewing or looking for a job, um, if there's a specific area, but with water and at EPA, there's just a diverse of so many programs in different areas that you might be thinking you're interested in one area and you explore so many areas as well. Um, so just to keep an open mind. You know, in a sim similar vein, I will underscore too that part of EPA's culture is to move around. So even though we uh, have long timers, 
people do hop around lots of different jobs and that keeps it uh, interesting and, and exciting here. We, that's definitely baked into our culture. Uh, there was a question that came up. Uh, uh, there are several, but this one says, can you give us example about interpersonal soft skills demonstrated in an interview? So I'll have Jason answer this question really briefly, and I want to make sure that I don't take too much time. Yeah. I, I still want to share some. Yeah, uh, that's why screen. I asked this question. Yeah. Awesome. Go ahead, Jason. Okay. Yeah, I really try to craft interview questions that provide people an opportunity to tell me a story. Tell me a story about a time you did X. And so the soft skills that we were looking for would be, for example, um, tell me about a time that you resolved a really difficult conflict um, with, with a peer or with a customer, or um, tell me about a time that um, a manager made a decision that went against your recommendation and how you dealt with that. Um, tell me about a time you got overruled. Um, how did you bounce back from that? So all of those um, provide an opportunity for the, res the respondent to think deep, a little more deeply about um, why they behave the way they do and gives us sort of actionable uh, intelligence uh, about uh, the kind of people we're bringing on board. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both Loretta and Jason for sharing your insights. And I want to end EPA's portion of our presentation by sharing with you folks some of our open positions that we currently have at the EPA. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. If you folks um, are inspired to work at the EPA in the future um, or at any federal agency, the um, Let's get to the right screen. Um, this website, the usajobs.gov website, is going to be the main hub where you're going to apply for any type of federal position. Um, and it's really important to understand that you need to set up a profile just like you would with Indeed or any other platform where you're applying for jobs. It's best to make a profile so that you can easily apply for jobs in the future. So I'm going to show you folks really quickly what it would look like to, you know, actually start looking for a job with us. And Jason, while I do this, is going to be putting um, a couple of our open vacancies in the chat. Um, so you can follow along if there's an open vacancy that you think is really interesting, you want to take a look at a little further. But you can also follow along with me in this main screen. So I just typed into the main uh, keyword box, Environmental Protection Agency. And as you can see, we have 121 different job openings right now throughout the country. And this is kind of overwhelming. So what I would recommend you do, um, you know, especially for example, if you're a student or you're a recent graduate, um, is to take a look at the filter section on this page. So on the right hand side here, it says top filters and you see all of these different icons. Um, you can click these different icons and it'll filter um, to the positions that you choose. So I went ahead and I'm filtering for um, students and recent graduates. Huh, for some reason that's not actually pulling up. Actually, agency, let's do that again. All right. So, we have 20 jobs for students and recent graduates here. Keep in mind that one thing that makes federal hiring and federal applications very different than the private sector and nonprofit is that there are um, different hiring pads or hiring groups that are allowed to apply to each vacancy. So for example, if Elon Musk wanted to apply to this life scientist, environmental engineer, and physical scientist position. Um, you see this little icon here. That icon represents recent graduates. So unless Elon Musk has recently graduated from college, um, he would not be able to apply and compete. So that is a benefit um, for folks to know as they're going through the federal hiring process. So, Next, I wanna show you folks a couple of open vacancies that we have. So 
you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, and as uh, Jason had mentioned during his portion of the presentation, we um, are hiring a lot in our agency. We are set to increase our region by about a third in size. We currently have 600, a little more than 600 employees. Um, we just hired 100 employees last fiscal year. Um, and because of the funding that we've gotten from the bipartisan infrastructure law, we are hiring um, a lot of open positions, particularly in uh, the water division, um, super fund and other divisions in the EPA. Currently, we have two internship positions open and a recent graduate position. So this open vacancy that you folks are looking at now, you guys should see student trainee, life science, engineering, and physical scientists. This is our uh, Pathways Intern STEM uh, position. And this is what it would look like to actually apply. You would go to this open vacancy, take a look at the information on here, um, and I'll guide you through what kind of to look at because these vacancies do have a lot of information. And then you can apply at the top right hand corner. Most of our vacancies are only open five to 10 days. So if you're a current student um, or you've been admitted into um, an additional program, you can qualify for this Pathways Internship Program. Um, and we have two different openings. We have this one for STEM folks who are you know, studying uh, engineering or they're biologists or chemists, you can apply to this opening. And we also have administrative openings. So if you, um, you know, are interested in environmental science or business and other more administrative series, you can apply to both openings. The admin series also includes lawyers. So if we have a couple of folks who are interested in going into that direction, please note that we hire a whole bunch of different um, folks from many different backgrounds. Our openings are usually only open five to 10 days. It's very, very important that when you're looking at an EPA opening, that you're first taking a look at the opening and closing date. The next thing that you would take a look at is who the job is open to. Remember, not every single position that you see on USA Jobs is going to be open to you. Um, you have to make sure that the position is open um, to your group. So this position is only open to current students. That means if you've already graduated, this is not a position that you can apply to and be considered for. If you verify that yes, you are a student and yes, you have enough time to submit your application, the next portion of the application that I would um, highly recommend looking at is the qualification section. So the qualification section is so helpful because this is going to be your guide to make sure that you put um, all the information on this section in your application materials, AKA your resume. All right, so for example, in the qualification section, there is always language in here that talks about either education requirement or your experience. So this is a student position. So the qualifications are gonna be tied to education. But if you look at other positions, um, they'll often say you need to have X amount of years of experience at the GS um, like seven, nine, 11 level. Um, depending on what position you're applying for. And they'll actually give you examples um, underneath all of those of what kind of uh, experience would count um, toward those grade levels. After you determine, yes, I'm qualified, then take a look at the duties section so that you can kind of figure out what you would be expected to do at this job. And then finally, the requirements section. So the requirements section here, along with um, required documentations, are very important to know. Um, with different 
um, job openings, you're going to have different documentation you're going to have to submit. So for example, all of the internship positions that we have in recent graduate, they're tied to education, right? So the internship positions, you have to be a current student. You're going to have to submit your unofficial transcripts so that we can verify that you're currently enrolled. If you're looking at a recent graduate position, you're going to have to submit, again, your unofficial transcripts from the school that you graduated from. Now, if you're thinking, well, this is great, Camille, but what if I have questions you know, after this presentation? Maybe I have questions while I'm going through an application process a few months later. There's always um, an HR personnel designated to each job announcement. So, for this job announcement, which again is the intern STEM position, the uh, point of contact is going to be Tara Johnson. And Tara has her email, her phone number on there. So you can get ahead of uh, a hold of Tara and ask those specific questions uh, regarding this particular announcement. Tara is not going to be your HR personnel for every single announcement. If we go ahead and pull up Another water division, um, another water division opening, um, this physical scientist, life scientist, and this is our recent graduate position. We'll see that we have another HR specialist um, that has been designated to this announcement. So please do not make the mistake of thinking I will always reach out to Tuanita or always reach out to Linda for all of your open position questions. Um, hmm. All right, so final thing that I wanted to make sure that you folks know before I go ahead and pass it back off to Ramsey is that when you make a USA Jobs profile, um, let's go back to this search engine here. So when you're searching for different positions, let's just say you're a current student, you're about to graduate, um, and you want to make sure that you get notifications um, and you're able to, to see all of the upcoming positions that come up for students and recent graduates. So whenever you choose a filter down here, and right now I have students and recent graduates selected, you can click this save this search button. And when you're logged into your USA Jobs profile, it'll save all of that search. So um, that in the future, like let's, for example, say that you were looking for student and recent grads and we didn't have any at this point, right? If you click save this search, any time that there are new positions that are open and you turn on your notifications in your USA Jobs profile, you will get notified whenever those positions do become available. And that's a great way to make sure that you're not missing that five to 10 day window to apply for positions with us. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back on to you, Ramsey. Oh, thank you, Camille and Loretta and Jason. There are a bunch of questions uh, related to uh, EPA, it looks like. So if you don't mind looking at them and maybe you can answer some of them. Uh, so uh, if that's okay. I've been working on several. Not Okay, good. Not thank through you. them all yet, but I've been working on it. Thank you. Okay, so, and I want to remind you, some of you started using it. Please, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box and we will get to them as, as, as we go through. And next, I would like to introduce uh, Claire Chung. Uh, Claire is the program manager for DWR's recruitment and workforce planning program. She leads the recruitment and workforce planning established the efforts by establishing and maintaining relationship with internal and external partners and providing consultation and advice to department management, supervisors, and administrative offices, officers on recruitment, workforce, and succession planning issues. Claire, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsey. And thank you everyone for being here and having us here today. And let me just share my screen very quickly. And of course, thank you, Camille, Jason, and Loretta for those great information. 
All right. So, hi again, everybody. As Ramsey mentioned, my name is Claire Chung, and I'm responsible for the Department of Water Resources (DWRs) Recruitment and Workforce Planning Program. So today, I'm here with uh, Chelsea, Emily, and Vince, who are our subject matter experts in the area of um, engineering at DWRs Apprenticeship Program. So today, I'm gonna start with a very brief. Um, intro of who we are. Then I'm going to hand the mic over to our SMEs. After our SMEs presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how you can get started with DWR, basically how to get a job with DWR or other state departments, because we basically use the same hiring process. Okay, so very quickly, DWR was established in 1956 by the California State Legislature. We manage California's water resources, systems, and infrastructure, including the state water project in a responsible and sustainable way. So the state water project is a water storage and delivery system of aqueducts, power plants, pumping plants, extending more than 700 miles, about two thirds of the length of California. It is the nation's largest state built multi-purpose user finance water project. It supplies water to more than 27 million people in Northern California, Bay Area, San Joaquin Valley, Central Coast, and Southern California. So state water projects water also irrigates about 750,000 acres of farmland in California. So apart from maintaining the state water project, we also manage flood waters. We monitor dam safety, conduct habitat restoration, and provide technical assistance and funding for projects for local water needs. We're responsible for the construction, maintenance, evaluation, and safety of a number of water infrastructure facilities, including 34 storage facilities, 21 dams, and 705 miles of canals and aqueducts. So other than all of these, we also offer a number of grant and loan programs that support activities addressing environmental stewardship, water supply reliability, public safety, and economic stability. That's the last that we do, I know. We also regulate the use of groundwater, which accounts for at least one third of all water use in California. So at DWR, we are embedding climate change response into every project we undertake. We have set standards to help evaluate how each project incorporates climate resilience policies, uh, principles, and ensure consistency across the department. So what's our mission? Our mission is to sustainably manage the water resources of California in cooperation with other agencies to benefit the state's people and to protect, restore, and enhance the natural and human resources. Currently, we have about 3,500 employees throughout California, um, all the way from maybe Oroville, all the way down to Glendale in the Los Angeles area. And we have a variety of career types within DWR, including engineering, environmental science, legal, accounting, HR, technicians, IT, and more. We also offer various student employment opportunities. So under our DWR student program, we have four different classifications. So there are youth A, student assistant, graduate student assistant, and student assistant engineering and architectural sciences. We currently have about 60 to 70 students in our student program. And even though getting a student post, uh, position is not a requirement for any of our full-time permanent positions, it is a great opportunity for students to gain some practical experience that's related to the area of studies and to actually network with professionals in different fields. And the best thing is you get paid as a student. And our student works very closely with our experienced professionals and receive hands-on training. So the training provided during our program is a really good way to make our students a more competitive candidate if they decide to apply for full-time position, either with us or other state agencies or private sector after college. So 
I know I've been talking for way too long. So mm -hmm. I'm just gonna introduce my first me. So we have Chelsea Spire. She is a senior water resources engineer from our division of regional assistance. So Chelsea, you have the floor. Thanks, Claire. So as Claire said, my name's Chelsea Spear and I'm a senior water resource engineer at DWR. And this is gonna be a really quick overview. So I just wanted to say upfront, if anybody has questions afterwards about getting a state job or what it's like to work at the state, I would be more than happy to chat. And my contact information is on the screen there. So I'm gonna start with a brief overview of the different kinds of works that work that I've been involved with at the department. And then I'll talk about just a few tips for navigating um, what I would consider a pretty bureaucratic process of getting hired with the state and how that differs from other jobs you might be applying for. So I'm a supervisor with um, four full-time engineering staff and a student assistant. And I've been in this role for about three years now. And right now I have a pretty unique position for an engineer, but I really love it. Um, I'm region coordinator, which means I keep track of what's going on in a lot of different internal programs and also with the local agencies that we support. And then I share that information between the various groups that I'm involved with. So about half of my work right now centers around sustainable groundwater management. And in 2014, um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, or SIGMA, was passed in California, which required that um, new local agencies be formed to manage groundwater, and also required that these local agencies submit plans that show how they will reach sustainable conditions within a 20-year time frame. So with SIGMA, the department has a regulatory and assistance roles. Um, we review the plans that these local agencies put together to determine if they're sufficient. And if not, there's a possibility that our um, sister agency, the State Water Resource Control Board, could take over the basin and restrict groundwater pumping until the locals um, can improve their plan to a sufficient level. So. The first iteration of all of these plans have been submitted to the department and right now all of my staff are involved with reviewing the plans. And then on the assistance side of groundwater management, we have um, staff assigned to each basin as a point of contact. And the point of contact's role is um, to attend the, the local basin meetings, answer questions, provide updates on our latest technical and financial resources, and then bring their concerns back so we can how to understand how to improve our assistance in the future. So kind of in a matrix management style, I coordinate with all of our POCs or points of contact on a monthly basis to hear what's happening at the local level and then <clears throat> share that with our headquarters group. And our assistance includes um, a lot of different data collection and distribution programs. And another big piece of it is um, financial assistance through our grant programs. So over the last few years, DWR has distributed hundreds of millions of dollars for groundwater planning and construction projects. Right now we have a grant that just opened for $230 million for, for these kind of groundwater projects. And another big thing um, that we're involved with in my office within the last two years has been drought response. So kind of similar to the point of contact role, we have staff assigned to each county to track um, drought meetings and the issues that um, individual counties are having. We have a dry well reporting tool and a tool to see where domestic wells are at risk of going dry in the future. And then again, we have lots of grant programs um, totaling in the hundreds of millions of dollars over the last two years and and specific grant programs will support either small communities or urban communities we have one that is um, focused on multi-benefit projects um, and then on an entirely different topic two of the staff in my section spend a, a big percentage of their time working on water supply and balance calculations that are used in the california water plan and this is a plan that's published on a five-year cycle. Um, and it, it looks at applied water throughout our um, quarter of the state that we work on. So how much irrigation is being used, how much um, 
water is used in urban areas and for managed wetlands and things like that. We also support our tribal affairs office. And my favorite project that I've been involved with over the past two years is being part of the department's racial equity team. And I'm proud to say we recently published a racial equity action plan that's publicly available. So if you um, just do a Google search for DWR and racial equity action plan, that would um, pop right up. And then the last role I'll mention with um, DWR that I've been involved in is it has a big role in flood protection and dam safety. So when I first joined DWR in 2015, I worked in a group that was focused on levee maintenance and I was part of an incident command team um, that got deployed during the 2017 floods. So that was pretty exciting. Um, I work with a lot of different engineers, environmental scientists, and engineering geologists, but there's also a lot of other job types at the department, and not all of them require a four-year degree. And then kind of shifting gears, when I um, joined the state, I didn't have any family or friends that worked at DWR. So whenever I get an opportunity like this, I like to share just a few tips that I found kind of unusual about the state hiring process compared to other places you might apply. Um, I've also hired several staff since starting my current role and helped um, on other hiring pa panels. And then I feel confident talking about this because as part of the racial equity team, we did a really deep dive into the current hiring practices at the department to look for places where we can make improvements in the future. So my number one tip is when you go to apply for most state jobs, you're first gonna need to fill out, um, complete an exam um, before you can be eligible to apply an interview. And for some classifications, this is an actual exam where you do things like solve math problems. But for a lot of many classifications like engineers, um, engineering geologists and environmental scientists, the exam is really more of a survey where you just rank yourself um, on a scale of how much experience or coursework you have on various topics. So it's not something to be worried about, but it is really important step that you complete it before applying because otherwise you won't be um, reachable and you won't be eligible to interview. Um, and then, so the next step, once you've taken the exam is to go to CalHR and um, apply. And our application process is a lot more involved than if you're just looking for jobs on a platform like Indeed, where you submit your resume and then um, submit it to all kinds of different organizations. You're, you're gonna need to complete a standard application. And then in addition, um, the hiring manager may ask for a resume, a cover letter, transcripts, a statement of qualifications, and or um, have you write about um, specific topic questions. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize is if a document like this is not specifically requested and, and you go ahead and submit it, it's going to be screened out by HR before the hiring managers get any of the um, application package. So if they don't ask for a resume, don't assume that they're um, going to see any of the materials that you uploaded if you upload a resume because it, it won't get to them. And then each step of the hiring process involves um, scoring where the hiring manager has to submit their scoring rubric to HR before seeing any of the applications or conducting interviews. So rather than applying to tons of positions, it's really, really worth your time to um, tailor your application to the job you're looking at. And this will put you far ahead of many people into making it onto the interview step. You wouldn't believe how many applications I've seen where um, people have it addressed to the entirely wrong agency or um, they didn't submit all of the required documents. And it, it's hard to move forward in the process if you don't um, tailor each application to the specific position. And then um, if I have more time, I'd, I'd love to add more, but one last unique thing about DWR's interviewing process that I wanted to mention is all the interviews are now required to include a diversity, equity, and inclusion question, which will count towards your overall score, score towards being hired. 
So this could be something like explain what diversity, equity, and inclusion means, or share an example that demonstrates your respect for people of all backgrounds and their cultural differences, or talk about challenges and opportunities you have experienced working with people from different backgrounds than yourself. So with that, I'll um, pass it over to Emily and Vince. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. So as Chelsea mentioned, next up, we have Emily, our apprentice program coordinator, and Vince, who is an um, apprentice program graduate instructor and now a plant maintenance branch manager here. So they're both from the Division of Operations and Maintenance, and they're here to talk about DWR's apprentice program. So Vince and Emily, please go ahead. Welcome, everybody. Uh my name is Vince Alvedris. I'm plant main superintendent here in San Joaquin Field Division. And along with me today will be Emily Stanley. She's our joint apprentice committee secretary. And we're just gonna talk with you today about the department's water uh, resources apprenticeship program. As it was stated, we move water 700, over 700 miles. And in order to do that, we need people with skills as mechanics, electricians, operators, and utility craft in order to get this water those 700 miles. State water project and flood maintenance. Along with moving that water, we also have to be able to uh, respond to floods and control those floods. So we do have sections uh, within the department that manage the flood uh, departments. Department water, Perfect. <laughs> but with this apprenticeship program, Department of Department Water Resources has an apprenticeship program that at the same time as we teach you a trade as an electrician or a mechanic, we also pay you to go through this apprenticeship program. And as I go through, I'll briefly explain more so on these programs. Next. about the program. DWR apprenticeship program started in 1971. It requires apprentice to spend three to four years depending on the trade. Once the apprentice has completed the program, they become a certified journey worker and graduate full to a full-time employment with the department. The apprentice is based on a written agreement called an indenture between the employer and the apprentice. This agreement spells out the length of the apprenticeship training and what kind of job tasks called for processes. Training triangle. During the apprenticeship program, it's on the job, in the classroom, and home studies. Classes are conducted here in San Joaquin Field Division, just, just south of Bakersfield. And also with through our apprenticeship program, you do get college credit to San Joaquin Delta College. Next. Apprenticeship programs and qualifications. You got to at least be 18 years old, have a high school diploma or educational equivalent, successfully complete the DWR apprentice civil service examination, have a valid California driver's license, and successfully be selected through the interview process. What okay. we're looking for, what we're looking for, we want someone has basic knowledge of arithmetic and ability to grasp and understand and perform mathematic complications. Demonstrate the ability to work with hand and power tools. Demonstrate the ability to learn and safely perform unskilled or semi-skilled work in maintenance or technical occupation. Ability to read and comprehend written instructions and procedures and listen and follow verbal instructions. Ability to read independently at a high school level to complete reading assignments involving concepts of electrical and mechanical equipment op operations and maintenance. Apprentice program exam. Prior to being accepted, a candidate must pass the DWR apprentice civil service exam. This exam covers math, including fractions, ratios, percentages, square root, geom geometry and algebra, in addition to reading and comprehensive and mechanical aptitude. Okay. 
apprentice training. HEP apprentice operate uh, HEP operator apprentices in utility craft. Their program is three years. For HEP electricians and mechanic apprentice, it's a four year program. 910 hours every six month period and, and 1,820 hours per year. So what we're saying is within that six month period, you have to work 910 hours and within one year, 1,820 hours. Apprentice advance every six months when select when related training, classroom, home study, and six month final and work process hours have been completed. Apprentices promote and are given a raise every six month period. Each trade and the required work process hours, curriculum and courses are approved by the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. The apprenticeship history. Program started in 1971 with seven apprentices. Four classifications, like we said, is electrician, mechanic, and utility craft. To date, we have graduated 581 graduates. 459 apprentices graduated. 122 utility craft apprentices have graduated. Currently, we have 100 apprentices in the program, 85 HEP, which is mechanics, electricians, and operators, and 16 UC. The largest apprentice class that we've had so far has been 46, and that's been this year. Since 2,309 apprentices have graduated. 85% of graduation graduates from the Department of Water Resource Apprenticeship Program have remained with the department. 18% and 61 of 339 graduates were able to accelerate advancement out of this program. 29%, which is 99 of 300. 39 of the graduates have promoted to lead or senior level or above. 15%, which is 51 of 339 graduates, have promoted to supervisor level or above. 13 former apprentices are now branch managers, and I, like we stated, I am one of them. Former apprentices have become field division managers, and right now we currently have one uh, current assistant division manager that went through the apprenticeship program. And have I gone past yours, Emily? <laughs> uh, I've asked, I was uh, going to go over slide five through nine, but you were, you covered them. You're doing so well. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? Uh, well, let's just go over electrical, uh, HEP electrical apprentice. It's a four-year program. And what that journey, what that apprentice does is work beside a journey worker. They receive training. On, on, the, on the job, and they can do an array of different tasks. It could be insulation, uh, repair of maintenance of wiring circuits for electrical equipment, motors, and control devices, and able to dissemble a main unit. They're able to do battery PMs, uh, install conduit, pull wire, uh, work on control boards, and be able to diagnose and troubleshoot electrical problems under emergency conditions. Mechanic apprentice is still a four-year program, and they also assist a journey worker that's a mechanic. They work besides that mechanic, and and they receive on-the-job training and, and duties such as working with piping systems, gearboxes, drive mechanisms, pumps, turbines, motors, and generators. And they can also work on compressors, HVA systems, welding machining, just an array of jobs uh, that's under mechanical section. Next, the HEP operator apprentices. That is a three-year program. Uh, unlike the mechanical and electrical and UC trade, they're more of inside the plant facility, the operation of moving that water or in a generation plant. They learn to follow safe operating clearance procedures, make routine inspections of generating and pumping units, accelerators, switch yard equipment. They do a lot of log logging. Uh, they're more of the 
overseers of the plant. They'll take the okays of work from a from an electrician or a mechanics. Uh, they'll do all around the plant inspections, uh, record uh, readings from instruments. Next. Utility craft worker is also a three year program. And those are our construction people. They learn a progressively skill work and repair and operation, modification, inspection, replacement, and maintenance of major civil and structures and related equipment associated with the State Water Project or Sacramento River Flood Control Project. They learn to operate heavy equipment, including dozers, backhoes, graders, and others. Operate large mobile cranes, and in the safe use of rigging, obtain a Class A California driver's license and operate transports and four-wheel drive vehicles. They're able to operate, okay? <laughs> and let me know if I get to your, your, your section, Emily. Okay. Oh, that, that next. So here's the, the HEP apprentice training. This is the array of, of classes that you would take along during the apprenticeship program. It's a long list, but again, you're on the job getting paid for this. Next. And here's just a classification for the UC apprentice and all the training and classes they go through. And as you see the picture, we have uh, simulations where you can either operate a crane in class or equipment such as a backhoe, a forklift, while you're on the job training. Next. Okay, Vince, I can pick it up from here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is our pay scales for the HEP electric, electrician and mechanic. So when you come into the program, you start at range A. And like Vince talked about, um, every six months as you meet the requirements, of the 910 hours, the classroom studies and the home studies, you can move through the ranges um, every six months. So you do get, you do get a pay raise. Uh, one of the unique things about our apprenticeship program is once you graduate the program, you're guaranteed a position. So if you see on here, the HEP electrician or mechanic one, once you graduate, that would be the position you're in and you're starting off at 7,891 um, and that's salary. And then the ranges mean, if you stay in that classification every year, you get a 5% into a 5% raise until you meet the end of that range, which for the one, it would be 9,782. Um, a lot of our apprentices uh, throughout their career, they move up to electrician and mechanic twos, supervisors, and then superintendents, and some even go all the way to the field division managers. Okay, and the next one. Um, this is the pay scales for the operator. It's going to kind of run the same as the um, electrician and the mechanic. The pay ranges are a little bit different, um, but you start at, you start with the program in range A, and every six months, if you meet the requirements, you go through the ranges. Um, until you graduate the program, you start off as a HEP operator range A at 7,891. Next. These are the pay scales for the uh, utility crafts worker. Um, they're a little bit, um, different than the HEP series. Um, but again, the same process. You start in range A. If you meet the requirements within the six months, you move to range B and you continue throughout the program. Vince, do you want to go, go over this slide? Yes. So on this slide, it kind of just looks and shows how much the department invests in the two apprentices. If we look at, to say, the top part, it says HEP electrical apprentice, it shows all the costs associated with that apprentice through those four years. You know, the training center cost is going to be up to 57000 The JC cost is 6000 Staff costs uh, here at the training center to assist you to become an electrician is 538000 with a total of 68, 602000 So it, it kind of shows... Um, 
the investment that the department puts into their apprentices uh, to get them to become qualified journey workers. Next. Okay, so I'll pick up on this one. Um, so here is our website for the apprentice program. On the website, it'll go over each trade. Um, it also goes over, um, Actually, I don't know if it does, but I'll kind of go over our timeline. Um, so the process to get into the apprenticeship program, it um, it starts, it's once a year. Around June, we advertise on the website um, and the Cal Careers website, we advertise for the exam. Um, it's about a 10 day advertisement where you can go in and you have to take the exam um, for each trade that you're interested in. Then once that exam window closes, about um, it's mid to end July, we then open up the position advertisement. So the advertisement will be open again for about 10 days. And this is to actually apply for the position. Um, after that 10 day window is over, we then get the apps um, and we see who applied for, that position, for the position and we hold interviews around September. Um, after interviews, so we still, it's kind of the same process Chelsea had went over. Um, you know, you're, we select um, candidates based off top scoring. And then, um, you know, all that, that review usually takes place between September, September and December. And then our apprentice start in January the following year. Um, we do have this past year, we did hire 46 apprentices, which was our la largest class. Normally, um, we only hire about 24 apprentices a year. So it's a little bit of a competitive um, process, but again, you're getting paid for on-job training and, um, and for being trained. Um, so it's a, wonderful, it's a wonderful program. And if you have any questions on our apprenticeship website, my direct phone number is on there and you can give me a call and I can answer any of your questions. All right, so thank you, Emily. Thank you, Vince, and thank you, Ch uh, Chelsea. So yes, it's me again. Um, so I know we don't have much time left, but I would really just want to talk very, very quickly about how to apply for a job with DWR or with basically any other state agencies. So, um, just remember, if you still have questions after today, uh, feel free to email me. My email address is right here, I think, on this side, recruited at water.ca.gov. I can schedule one-on-one -on -one with you. I can connect you with any of us, me, Chelsea, Vince, Emily, or someone else. Um, so very quickly, I always tell people to create a Cal Careers account. So if you click on the screen, it should take you directly to Cal Careers website. Cal Careers is an employment system administered by the California Department of Human Resources. So with an account on Cal Careers, you'll be able to apply for most of the exams, track your exam scores, save your job search so that you can get a, little, a, a notification if a new job that meets your search criteria comes up, whether it's the location, whether it's a specific types of job, or um, it's part-time, full-time, or anything like that. You can also apply for job vacancy online. And you can also store your job application history. You can create a template to apply for different jobs. But like Chelsea mentioned earlier, you always want to tailor your application. So to search for an examination or assessment or a job vacancy, you can go to DWR's website and click on the search job or search exam box, or you can go directly to Cal Korea's main site. So if you only want to go to one place, to search for a DWR's job, maybe Cal Fire's job, CHP's job, Cal Korea should be where you're going to because Cal Korea basically require all state departments, all state agencies to advertise all of our job, job openings on their website. So if you want to go to just one place to look for jobs from all the different departments, Cal Careers will be the place to go to. So for most of the state classifications, except for non-testing classifications, such as the student assistant positions or other temporary positions, all the applicants are required to establish um, a, 
a um, an eligibility either by examination or maybe by some other ways. So if you have never had a state uh, job before, if you just got out of college, you just graduated, chances is you will have to take an assessment or examination either online, in person, or anything like that in order to establish your eligibility. So it is very important for you to do that because except for non-testing classifications or maybe for transfer employees, very often departments can only hire someone who has list eligibility. So it must be established and list eligibility prior to the date of hiring, which means you do not need to take the exam in order to apply for a position, or you do not need to take the exam in order to attend a job interview. However, if you have been selected for the position, you must pass the exam and establish your eligibility before your date of hire. So having said that, oh, I'm sorry. We are running out of time, close, right? Yeah. If you take okay. a couple of minutes, please. Okay, it's super great. So I'm gonna skip yeah. a lot of stuff. Examination and apply, review the job advertisement, tailor your application, submit all required documents, filing deadline. We do not accept application that submit after deadline and always have the contact information. And just so everybody know, of course, we're on social media, click on any of this. It will take you out to our site and connect with us. One more thing. Um, we are one of the department under the California Natural Resources Agencies, and we have this brand new career center located in downtown Sacramento. If you're happening to, uh, to be in the area, you want to come in and like, hey, how do I develop my resume? How do I apply for a state job? Or any other questions like this, please stop by and talk to us. You can also email me to schedule a virtual um, virtual appointment. I can connect you with recruiters from maybe um, State Parts or Fish and Wildlife, Kill Fire, and all the other state agencies under CNRA as well. So I'm so sorry I was talking so fast, <laughs> that's, but that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Claire, Chelsea, Emily, and Vince. Uh, now we go to our next uh, speaker, Sam Hawkinson, who is uh, a CWA committee member for the Students and Young Professionals Committee. Sam has six years of experience working within engineering related industry. He was a project manager for land developer and a home builder, uh, a civil engineer at a municipal wastewater uh, treatment plant. And now he's uh, working with uh, Brown and Caldwell and engineering, environmental engineering consulting firm. So, uh, and Sam lived in Washington, Oregon, California, and was a volunteer member for associations across all these three states. So he has experience and he'll talk about the benefits of being active and be participating in committees. Sam, the floor is yours. Great, Ramzi, thank you for that introduction. I appreciate that. And I, I'm happy to be here uh, talking to you all today. Uh, as you can tell by the vest, I'm out at a, a job site, and that's one of the fun things about now being a consultant and before that working for municipality is just, for me, it's always been about being on site and, you know, having now the benefit of having lived all along the West Coast, I've been able to experience a few different uh, member associations in Oregon and Washington. It was the Pacific Northwest Clean Water Association. And in California, now it's the California Water Environment Association. And all of those are member groups of WEF, the Water Environment Federation. And, you know, for me, a lot of the great opportunities that I've had in my career have really come from volunteering with member associations. You know, there's a lot of different factors that go into what makes volunteering so great. The first being community. Um, joining a member association automatically puts you in a community of like-minded individuals who are all working towards the same goal, especially if, you know, if your interest is water related, specifically water, wastewater, one water reuse, you know, all of these things are under this, this member association groups. And it can be really great to, to uh, 
to join and get to know other people who are doing the same things you're doing. Um, for me, a lot of the opportunities that I, I've had have come from joining the groups and then volunteering time and subcommittees like uh, students and young professionals is a great way to get involved. And being a part of one of these subcommittees, you get to meet people from all over the state. And, you know, depending on the organization, like some are countrywide, like WEF, you can meet people from all over the country. And what was great for me going from being a municipal engineer to now a consulting engineer was I first started going to my local member association and I got involved and I went to the annual conference and I kept getting more and more involved, volunteering more time. And through that, I was able to meet other like-minded people from, you know, from Brown and Caldwell where I work now. And after the, the year or so of developing this ongoing relationship with folks from Brown and Caldwell, they eventually have offered me the opportunity to come and interview for a job with them. And it just so happened to be what I was kind of looking for at the time too, that I was looking to make that jump into the consulting world. And really that, that all came from just volunteering at, um, at my local member association. And now that I'm down here in California, I've continued uh, volunteering now with CWEA. I think that you know, there's just so much that you get out of being a part of these associations. The community that I spoke to before, job opportunities and networking, I think is huge. And, you know, the cool thing is you don't have to be a licensed engineer. You don't have to be a consultant or even working at a municipality or state or federal government you can just join a member association, uh, especially people who are looking to break into this field, and especially students. I think this is a really good and attractive thing that you can do kind of right now to help your chances of breaking into this market as you, as you continue to volunteer time and grow. I think that's really, if I was ever to give someone advice on how to break into water or wastewater, the first piece would be to join a member association. Um, and just, it's cool to meet people that care about the things you care about. You know, on, on that personal level, a lot of friendships are also made kind of meeting all these people. And that's what I really want, those are the key points I really wanted to highlight today of what you can really get out of joining a member association. And I love to just open it up to any questions that anyone might have as well. Okay, thank you, Sam. And uh, um, let's see, let me, as, as people uh, write questions, let me just give a, an overview of what we heard and also yeah. uh, maybe highlight a few of the questions and uh, uh, that we we received, and I know uh, Jason, I think, responded to a bunch of them. Okay, so what we heard is uh, first is about soft skills, I think. Uh, that's one, and, and that falls in the category of what we call emotional intelligence, and, and that's by itself, it's a webinar uh, ally. So, uh, but it is important, you know, obviously your knowledge and experience is very important. Like Sam mentioned, being involved, that's really part of uh, emotional intelligence, being, you know, open to uh, engage with people, uh, know what you know and, and know what you don't know too. That's, that's important. The other thing is uh, that was mentioned several times, there is a process. You're talking about, in this case, government type positions. So each one, you know, we saw an example of the federal, we saw an example of the state. The key here, again, goes back to soft skills is to be patient. Really, I mean, uh, I worked for the state for a while. This is back a long time ago. We'll not talk about that, but it took about 18 months. From the day I took the exam, wasn't online, it was an exam, until it, 
the positions opened and three positions came at the same time. So I had to really decide which one I want to take. But we're talking 18 months waiting. So these days, I doubt that the waiting will be that long because there are so many positions open. But these are the, the things that we got out. I mean, there was a quite a bit of useful information from the group. This is the group that deals with hiring and deals with working with other people and so on. So uh, I, I noticed a bunch of questions related to EPA, and I think some of them were asking about, is the US citizenship required as I'm glancing through it? Camille, you wanna address that? Yeah, so for most of our open positions, when you're looking at USA jobs, there oftentimes is going to be that US citizenship requirement, although there are different federal agencies and every job announcement is different. So it's very important when you're looking at jobs to take a good look at um, that um, who can apply section that hiring path or hiring authority section. And there's usually more information about that. But if you're thinking, oh, what a bummer, I'm an international student, I really wanna get involved, or you know, you have some other documentation status, which is you know, different than a US citizen, um, I will put this link in the chat, but there is a program called the Oak Ridge Institute. Um, well, we call it ORISE, Oak Ridge Institute of Science and Engineering, I think is what the, um, uh, what the program is spelled out to be. Basically, that's a program that subcontracts with many different federal agencies, not just with the EPA, and they're primarily doing research um, for a lot of different federal agencies. In fact, we have a lot of ORISE fellows um, at the EPA who, that really do amazing work and, and they're contributing to our mission as much as you know, our interns and other uh, full-time mm -hmm. employees with us. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that in the chat. And the best part about the uh, link that I'm gonna share with you for the ORISE program, you can actually filter based on your citizenship status um, to see what positions are available to you. Most of them are going to be research, uh, but I'll go ahead and put that in the chat. Claire, anything to add to this requirement? Yes. The citizenship? So for the state of California, not a lot of classifications require someone to have a citizenship. So the only one I can think of is probably law enforcement. So if you want to be a police officer, you might need, you definitely need to be a citizen. However, in the Department of Water Resources, we do not really have a classification that says you have to be a citizen. So it doesn't matter if you're a student or if you are a resident, as long as you have proof that you can work in the US, you can apply for a job and get a job with us. Okay. Thank uh, you. Sam, there is an, a question directed to you says, could you tell us uh, a bit more about what your work is like in consulting? Yeah. Fav these favorite parts, uh, any comparisons between consulting and government work? Yeah, honestly, I'd love to, I'd love to speak to that. Um, there's, definitely, there's definitely some big differences between the two. For instance, when I worked at the municipality, we had a hard rule if you can't work more than 40 hours a week. So even if there was more work to do, you still have to go home and stop working at the end of the week. And that's not true with consulting at all. Um, I regularly in consulting and working 50 hour weeks, um, which I enjoy because I really like my projects. And that's another difference. Uh, when I worked for municipality, a lot of that was putting out requests for proposals for construction projects we wanted to engage in or pilot studies we wanted to do or different upgrades to the wastewater treatment plant. And then we'd receive them and kind of rank them and decide you know, who we're going to go with for the design. And so it was much more removed from the process and much more at that you know, a thousand foot level looking down and observing. Whereas in consulting, you're really like boots on the ground out there trying to make all this stuff come together. I'd say my favorite part about consulting is 
the variability of what I get to do. Um, I really did only a small amount of things when I was at the municipality. And now that I'm a consultant, I am doing, you know, I, I have multiple clients. So sometimes I'm traveling between the different job sites to help them, you know, accomplish their goals. Sometimes I'm doing work actual design work where I'm designing a new treatment plant or a new part of a treatment plant. And on other projects, I'm reviewing the submittals from the contractor to make sure that they're getting what they designed for. And on other projects, I'm kind of even more removed from the process, just providing another set of eyes on construction that's occurring or writing guides for how to use the equipment that they've now installed at a treatment plant. And so I feel like that's a, a good sort of difference between the two. And I no two municipalities are the same. I know a lot of times they'll have very different structures. And for instance, the one I was at was really small. So there was two engineers the entire wastewater treatment plant so we had to do everything. We do mechanical, electrical, instrumentation and controls, structural. We, we had to kind of be a jack of all trades. Whereas I know at a lot of larger municipalities, you will be in more of a small group. And the, the small group is somewhat similar to consulting. You kind of end up being in one lane. Like for me, that lane is generally process mechanical. So pumps, pipes, general equipment. And then, you know, if I'm designing something, I reach out to my electrical engineer, to my instrumentation and controls engineer, my structurals, and we kind of come together as one unit. Thank you, Sam. Uh, is there any, we have a couple of minutes. Is there any comments or question that you saw that grabbed your attention? Jason, you looked at a lot of questions. Okay, silence. That's good. Well, let's see. Oh, Alec, do you Nancy. have any? Sorry, Camille. Sorry, I I saw that there's a raise hand feature, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna give that a try oh. and see. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wanted to let folks know that, um, you know, for me, I came into the EPA under the Pathways Internship Program, and. Um, for this internship, there is an ability, um, if you meet the requirements to go from a GS4, so when you're going entry level, to, you know, go and get promoted up to the GS11 level, depending on how many years of experience you have and what you're going to school for. Um, when I was in this program, it was really helpful. I'm first generation, by the way, so um, I had to pay my way through my master's program. And, you know, having um, this internship along with the other two internships that I had in my master's program, it, it helped me pay off my master's degree, my very expensive master's degree. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is oftentimes the story of a lot of the interns that we hire on. Um, currently, we have 20 interns at EPA Region 9. Um, last year, when we went through and you know, we hire interns and when they complete their internship, if they have all the requirements, they can get a permanent position like me and a lot of other interns who have stayed with us. Last year, when we went through that conversion process, every single one of our interns qualified for a permanent position and every single one of them got a permanent position. Oh, wow. So we had a hundred percent conversion rate and wow. this rate uh, this year is looking really similar to 80 to 90 percent conversion rate. That's, um, that's it's one of the things that we're really proud of in our region and really helps diversify the region as well. So just in case there are other first generation folks, um, it's a really great option if you're really looking to help pay your way through college. That's great. Well, uh, this comes to the close. Thank you very much for your help to get the information out and to participants my best best wishes for your future endeavors and i hope 
to see you as a leader in our industry. Remember, we talked about passion. Thank you for joining us. Be kind to each other and bye.